Pastor, you want to pray for us? Absolutely. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Uh, we thank you for joy and laughter and friendship. And for a time to uh, uh, set aside tonight and, and think about uh, time and our priorities and the, the busyness and the, the hectic schedule and pace of life that we keep. Um, give us wisdom uh, from your word and from your spirit. Uh, teach us. Teach us to number our days and teach us uh, to, use, uh, to use our time wisely. And uh, so uh, your word says that uh, you will uh, give wisdom uh, without reproach if we would ask. And so uh, humbly uh, we ask for wisdom that comes from you um, so that our, our, our days and our lives are, are filled um, with uh, the important things and the best things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, as promised, we tonight are going to talk about another one of the pitfalls um, that we can experience in life, whether you are single, married, have kids, don't have kids. This tonight's topic, looking at busyness, how we use our time, is something that we all can relate to. But it is something that can definitely um, affect the, um, our homes, the trajectory, um, the stress level in our homes, our marriages, um, our relationship with our kids. Um, even, our, even our physical health can be affected by the topic that we're going to address tonight. So this is a good one. So I hope for a lot of discussion, interaction, and as we kind of get into some just uh, exercises that we're going to do along the way. Really encourage you to, to do them as we, as we go through this. And I think it'll be really helpful for each of us just to pause and think about these things for a little bit. Before we jump into those, though, I wanted us to start with Scripture. And on the page you've got in front of you are just 10 passages. Uh, there are plenty more we could choose. But these 10 just speak to... What, what Scripture says about either our time or how we prioritize things, uh, things that we value. And, and so let's look at these, just kind of glance over them right there where you sit. Um, let me ask, how many of you would say at least one of these passages on this page you've committed to memory? Like you, you would know, you would know one of these, uh, you know one of these passages at least. Anybody? You got one? All right. Where your treasure is, there your heart is, that's one. What's another one uh, that you know? Have no other gods before me. Can't serve two masters. Seek ye first. Anybody? Anybody learn that one? I remember as a, remember my, all my, that's right. I remember my younger siblings' cassette tapes going in the minivan uh, had that, those, some of these verses uh, to music. Uh, I remember listening to those uh, as a teenager with my little sisters in the car. I was so cool. Um, so as we think through these verses, what, um, what jumps out at you about about some of these when you think about them in relationship to time and priorities. Anybody? Okay. Okay, so they, they have a, a focus on the kingdom of God, eternity. They've got a, um, a perspective that's not just focused in the here and now. That first one tells us what our first priority must be, right? It can't. What about Exodus 23? As we think through, even this is you know coming from the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Why would we, why would we even put that passage in here when we say, hey, let's see what the Bible has to say about our time or our priorities? Why would we list that one here? Okay. So our priorities can become idols, can become gods in our life. Yes. Well, we will have a time to talk about culture and sports. That is correct. 
that's you know, I would add to that. So the, the, this verse tells us two things. One, it tells us uh, uh, that God must be our top priority. So it already establishes that. Uh, but then also, as mentioned, it also reveals that it is very possible for us to get these priorities mixed up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's very easy. Um, what about <clears throat> Matthew six twenty four? We uh, that one came out a minute ago. Can't serve two masters. Right? We talk about this one. We talked about it last week in relationship to money. So why does it come back? Why does it surface again tonight? when we're looking at our priorities and how we use our time. Okay. Yeah. She said you can use time as a constant source to gain money. All right. Okay. And he said, and no time for God. Can we become servant to our schedules, to our jobs, to our to-do lists, to our, all the activities that we fill our, our day with? Can, can we almost, almost become a slave to those things? Yeah, guilty, right? Like uh, my, you know, my calendar uh, <laughs> becomes the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm beholding to. Um, it, it can very easily become that. So Scripture's clear, we cannot serve two masters. So if, if, our, if our calendars are what drive everything, if they kind of set everything in motion that we do, uh, we gotta be really, we gotta be really careful um, about not letting that become, um, become our master when it comes to, to how we prioritize in, in, in busyness. Any others on here? Any of these other passages teach you something just Initial, immediately as you read them about, oh, the relationship between our topic tonight and, and this passage. Yeah, what about Psalm 90, verse 12? It says, so teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. What, what does that have to do with time and priorities? All right, yeah, so, so she said, when you prioritize your days and when you realize, uh, sorry, when you realize that there's a finite number of days and you really focus on, it forces you to also think through your priorities uh, so that way you can get certain things done, just to summarize what she said. Okay. Okay, one, so, so if you couldn't hear, Kyle said uh, it, it fools us that we are in control of our days. So one, God is in control of the ultimate number of days that we have, right? Um, two, isn't it a folly of youth to think that your days are unlimited? Yeah, you don't need God when you have unlimited days. It's a folly of youth to think, right, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to have my health forever. You get older, you realize, uh-oh, you wake up with aches and pains, and it's only going one direction, and they're finite. Yeah. So God's the only one who knows. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even just this relationship, right, that w when we, like when we learn to number our days, to understand that, that, that we are finite, that, that our days are precious, our time is precious. The Bible says there's wisdom in, in that. There is wisdom in knowing that, that life Life is short. Our earthly life is short. And to make the most of that, to use our time to the fullest is, is what wise people do. And so that is a, that's a good press for us. 
um, because it is very easy to just not be very intentional, which I think is one of the things we'll, we'll see as we go on tonight. It was a convicting thing even getting ready for tonight to think so many days I am not intentional with how I use my time. I just kind of, I'm along for the ride. Uh, and that's, and yeah, that's it, what this verse is. It's the opposite of what this verse is saying. Well, it's embedded in the verse, right? Mm -hmm. Teach me because naturally we don't, right? Teach me and I will have a heart of wisdom to number my days. Because again, what, what's bound up in the heart of man is, is folly and foolishness without the wisdom of God. Yes. And then the last one on the page, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Uh, speaks to the same, same thing that Psalm 90 does, right? Look carefully then how you walk. It's another one of those examinations to say, you know, saying, the psalmist saying, teach me. Paul admonishing uh, the church, hey, look carefully at what you're doing, at how you walk. He says, don't be unwise, but be wise. And what does he equate walking wise? What does he equate that to? Yeah, what does he say in the verse? Making the best use of time. The difference between walking foolishly or unwise and wise, Paul says, is making the best use of, of our time. So that's what I hope we can do tonight, is, is think through how to, how to apply that, how to actually live out this admonition that we see right here. One helpful thing, an encouragement to you, uh, scripture memory is something that I would dare say a lot of Christians uh, don't, don't commit to, don't take seriously is actually hiding God's word in their heart and t committing passages to memory. And so with a list of 10 verses here, here's a challenge. Memorize one of these a week. Find somebody either in this room or someone close to you, someone that could hold you accountable and do this together, but, but make it a priority to memorize each of these. Some of these you're probably already going to know, you're familiar with, so some are going to be very easy. Uh, some of them you may, it may take you a minute to, it's like, I, I wasn't familiar with this verse, I need to learn this verse, but you would be um, so encouraged and even surprised to see how when we commit scripture to memory, how often the Holy Spirit brings it to mind at a time when we really need to be reminded of the truth that's in these verses. So that's just an encouragement is you've got a list of 10 verses here that speak to how we use our time and, what, and how we prioritize things in our life. Commit these to memory and watch God use them in your life. So a little challenge there on that first page. But let's keep going. Flip on over to, to the next page. Let's talk about, let's answer a question here. And think about why are we so busy? Anybody in the room say that busyness is not a struggle for you? I think that would be easier show of hands to say, no, I don't struggle with that. I'm just really here for moral support for all of you people who, who do struggle. Yeah, please raise your hand. Yeah, anybody here just for moral support? Uh, it's not a, not, a, not a challenge for you? Okay, good. We're among friends. We're all in this. So. Why are we busy? Have you ever, you ever used any of these sentences? I bet everybody can do this. I am pressed for time. I am running out of. There aren't enough hours in the day. Anybody said one of these before? Anybody ever said two of these on this? How about all three? Anybody said all three of those today maybe even, right? Um, <laughs> Right, so, so we get this. This is a, a something that, that we all struggle with. So I want us to think through seven, and there's, there's others, but these are seven that I want us to focus on tonight that you see on this page. Seven reasons why we might be as busy as we are. Seven things that maybe are at the root of why busyness is an issue for, for us. So let's talk about those for a little bit. Um, the first one is that we view busyness sometimes as a badge of honor. What do you think we mean by that? It's a status thing. 
Eric says is uh, when, we, when we're busy, if we can say, man, I'm so busy, or people see that we're busy, uh, it's kind of a status. It shows our importance or value. Where does this one come into play a lot of times for us? Work. Yeah, this is one, this would definitely be one uh, within the, in the context of our jobs. We would say busyness, you know, carrying that. Like, I am so busy. I must be indispensable. I am so busy. Everything, right? I have to do it all, right? It's, um, we will equate it to value. So sometimes we lean into busyness because of, because of that. Um, but I want to stop for a second um, around this idea of work because these first couple of, reasons why we might be so busy have to do with work. How many of you guys, let's take a poll of the room. How many of you think that as Americans, we work more hours on average now than we ever have before? Anybody think that? Would you say, yeah, like we are probably work more hours now than ever before. Okay. How many think no? Maybe not. I, I think, I think that's, all right. So, and then how many people were too scared to answer? Because uh, you don't want to be wrong. So. <laughs> All right. So, actually, they began, I found this out, they began tracking uh, this statistic back in 1948. Like, how many hours Americans average working per week? And in 1948, that number was 42.8 hours a week that Americans average working. Today, that number is actually 38.7. So, four hours. So, yeah, almost four hours here, four hours less per week, right? So busyness, right? We, we equate it with work, right? And we, and we would even say maybe some, one of the reasons maybe we're so busy is because we work more. Well, statistics don't back that up. We don't necessarily spend more hours at work but yet we probably feel busier than probably any generation has, has before us. But it's not necessarily there. But busyness can be um, self-imposed in a work environment, right, because of how the value we think that is a t ends up attached to us because of our workload or what we do. What about as job security? They kind of attach to this a little bit, but... Um, Anybody ever been guilty of, of this, thinking this way that, you know, if, I, um, if I'm really, really busy, right, even if I just look busy, maybe even if I'm not busy, if I just look really busy, uh, that, that, you know, there's job security in that. They're going to keep me around. I had employees at Chick-fil-A uh, that loved to do that. They would, they would work at all the right moments when they thought I was looking. Uh, they would appear really busy because um, they thought it would get them more hours, raises in pay, all, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so we, busyness is attached to, to what we do in our work. Do you agree with those two? Um, how about this next one? Busyness as a way to avoid FOMO. Any hip, cool people who know what FOMO is in the room? We gave the definition right next to Oh, I did? It's in your paper. It's not up here. Sorry. I've got them up here, and we don't have them, but you've got them on your. Did anybody know it before you read it? Got a few people knew what it was. Fear of miss. No? Fear of missing out. So, what do you think? Well, Pull in the room a little bit yeah, here. What do you think we mean by this? <laughs> All right, yeah, because she's saying because of social media, right, there is a constant fear of missing out, and that this could be a cause, a contributor to. Busyness, right? Um, I read an article that um, talked about this. It said a generation, like the pre-social media generation, had a trap, and there was a, a, a phrase that was used: "Keeping up with the 
Joneses all had to do with um, stuff. Right? The, the idea was I need to have it all. Right? I, I need to gain, I need to have all the right stuff. I need to have it all. But because of social media, they said there's actually been a shift in mentality. It's not about having it all. We're moving away from having it all slightly, but now the focus is more experiencing it all. And some of that is social media. We see people's pictures. We see, uh, you know, their stories, their reels, all these things about their, their travel, their vacations, the, things, the places they go, the stuff they do. And they paint these incredible pictures of what's going on. And without even realizing it, we start to develop this, this fear of, well, I haven't experienced that. I need to do that. Right? I need my family to have that same perfect, my family needs to look just as perfect in, in my pictures as their family looked in theirs, and they went to this cool place, so I need to go to a cool place, right, so I can keep up with experiences. It's a real thing, and, and we will fill our lives with busyness in order to make sure we're not missing experiences that, that maybe we should have in order to feel fulfilled uh, and, and worthwhile. I see it a lot. Um, how about you? Yeah, when you think through just uh, the, the endless curiosity in, in hobbies and in things that you can get involved with. Now, these things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but one of the things that you're going to hear a lot tonight is... Um, is choosing uh, the best things over just good things, right? So there's lots of good things that you can do and that you can be involved in, uh, and uh, uh, hobbies, interests, and oh, I, I would like to do that, I would like to do that. Um, but a lot of times it, when we stop and analyze it, it's those sorts of things, guys, that are filling our lives and overwhelming us, filling us with busyness that doesn't necessarily have to be there. Yeah, it's, we're, we're choosing uh, the stress, the, <laughs> the worry sometimes that comes uh, with, and the exhaustion that comes with uh, a schedule that is totally unmanageable. If we stop and think, sometimes we're actually bringing it on ourselves by, by choices we make that aren't, aren't a necessity. These next two that we're going to look at go together, uh, numbers four and five. We're going to talk about these together. Uh, that busyness, uh, we can see this as a byproduct of just living in a digital age. And also, busyness for many of us can also be a time filler. How are those two things connected? Let's start there. Why would we say, hey, we're going to look at these uh, together? It's a byproduct of living in a digital age. And busyness sometimes can really be simply nothing more than just filling time. What do you think? Okay, you got 24, Eric says you can always work on your computer from anywhere. So you got 24 seven access to work, even when you're not at work. Do we have any email junkies here? Or former email junkies, even if you've just retired, yeah. What is an email junkie? You, you can never stop looking. You wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you do. You check your email, right? Is, is, is work, does work need me? Does work, they're depending upon me. It's that constant checking those emails, right? Yeah, it doesn't even have to be the email. We'll just text, right? Even faster, more convenient, easier, okay? So those lines get blurred. Right, work comes home, uh, and and we can't we can't separate yeah, it didn't those use, things. It didn't used to be that way, right? You could leave work at work and then come home, and and there was no connection, right? Think back to a pre-digital age, but but then oh, there's this modern convenience of my boss can email me even if it's at nine at night, and then you read it, and then what have you thought about the rest of the night? Those sorts of things, right? You you don't. There's no hard separation. And so that can make us 
busier, right? Because you don't turn it off. Right. And it's funny. Think about this. Uh, it's, it's ironic that you know we developed these things. When these things were developed and they they became more and more common, they came with the promise of they would simplify our lives. Uh, it's going to save time, right? If we have the ability to email, think how much more we can get done than than having to go meet somebody face to face or talk to them on the phone, right? We can shave all these minutes and hours off of our day and really be less busy, have more leisure time. But it doesn't, it didn't happen, did it? No, we, we actually end up, you know, thinking about it more and, and, and actually not being able to separate those, those parts of our lives out from each other. Um, how else would these two things be connected? Think like in times when you like are idle, you may reach for your phone instead of like sitting in silence or like mm. letting some internal thoughts or introspective thoughts come up. You get some some kind of external data, entertainment, stimuli. There we go, guys. I actually think this is huge. So if you couldn't hear the the statement really good. was, you know, previously uh, in cultures in the entire history of the world. You had downtime, right? Don't you love timepiece TV shows when, uh, um, when, when you think back in the Victorian era when for entertainment they would gather around and watch the one person who could play the piano play the piano? You're like, oh, this was our entertainment tonight. Um, so, but you had downtime, right? Your brain stopped. It rested. You, it, like, like, but now what do we do? The second you've got downtime, you reach for your phone, it's all in the palm of our hand. By the way, all statistics uh, talk about uh, that this smartphone has completely uh, changed generations, right? There are certain generation changes, and there is one at the smartphone, and what's happening after that is, is crazy, 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 because of this, right? The moment there's a just a smidge of downtime. You pull this out. Some of you check your email. Others of you, what do you do? You go to social media. You uh, so so you have your certain forms of entertainment, okay? Uh, and you search. You search for stupid. I mean, just asinine information off Google, okay? Mindless stuff, right? A lot of our but. It winds up your brain, and it never stops, okay? These social media apps are programmed to be addictive. They, they've massively changed from when they first came out. They've all adopted a style of flip, 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 flip this way or flip this way. And it's, it's mindless information, but it's addicting. It, it literally begins to suck your brain into patterns. Daniel, tell them the statistic about how long the average American is on social media in one day. I don't think they want to know. I don't think you want to know this. <laughs> All right. Right now, and believe it or not, this is actually down a few minutes. It's down 10 minutes from last year. All right, so when you hear this, just know we've improved by 10 minutes in the last 365 days. Um, 143 minutes per day the average person spends on social media. Guys, that's, that's two and a half hours. Because it used to be 150. That's two and a half hours a day. The average American. And the deal is your phone will tell you how long you've spent on there. And you know you look at that and you're like, no way. That can't be. I did not. Well, I did some math. Is someone in the middle of the night getting my phone and just, like, there's no way it could be that long. Did not waste two and a half hours 
looking at recipes on social media, right, or life hacks. I did not do that. That then turned into clips from Friends television shows, right? Every time I would go from recipe to life hack to, oh, there's an episode of Friends. I need to watch that. Um, so let's, let's just kind of, let's do the math. Let's, let's take this. If we spend two and a half hours a day, 143 minutes a day, you could take that out and say the average person then would spend 3.4 million minutes in their lifetime on social media, which is the equivalent of six and a half years. But Daniel, that's six and a half years straight. So what if you factored in sleeping for eight hours a day during that six and a half years? We're well over, what, 10 then? We've spent 10 years. You're almost at 10 years of your life on social media. That's the average American. Could you imagine right now, and then 10 years from now, all we would have done is push up, next, next scroll over, you know, Google search some random goofy thing, and on and on it goes. Yeah. And I will tell you guys, um, as, a, as a former youth pastor, I uh, spent 20, I guess, 22 years maybe working with students uh, as well as families and children. So you never, if you spend that long doing it, you never stop thinking from that perspective of, of the next generation and how, how adolescents are being affected by things. So just thinking about these statistics and then knowing the number of families that I visit with who will talk to me about their kids being anxious, being depressed, struggling to just settle in and just be able to handle and adapt to changes uh, in their environment, right? It's just like my kids are so nervous. They're so wound up. The more I press in and the more I think about that, you, I, can, I continue to find just correlations here to those levels of anxiety, those levels of depression um, are directly related to what we're talking about right now. The more kids spend on devices, Right, the more they're they're just kind of mindlessly doing these things, the less they're actually able to cope with just life. Um, and I think I think there is a very much of a relationship between seeing um, the number of students who are needing counseling because of anxiety and depression, and the amount of time we spend on on these kinds of things. Like they, they, there, there is connection there. Yeah, I, I would say it's doing two things. One, what our brother said here, the mind never stops racing. So you're, you're training your brain like this. But then the other thing that it does is it, uh, uh, is it comforts, right? And so there's a little bit of that dopamine that's always included in there. And then when, when you have to deal with reality of the real world um, and difficulties come, Right? You, you've conditioned your brain to just be so mushy all the time with pleasure, pleasure, pleasure that any sort of conflict in the real world just becomes like, why would that ever be there? Yeah, and you, you could get into, really get into psychology there and say that, you know, we need sleep because that is how our brains take the things that are in our conscience brain and sorts them and deals with them and files them away, so to speak, into our subconscious so that when we wake up the next morning, we're able to take in more data and process more things. And that's what sleep does every night. It just, it helps process the stuff that's happened throughout the day and we're ready for another day's worth of, of, of stuff. So when we don't sleep, uh, it begins to affect our, our, our minds. It begins to affect our emotional state uh, and even then eventually our physical state. Well, when the last thing you do before you go to bed tonight, at night, is scrolling through social media, right? Even your sleep is affected by that. 
uh, it takes longer to fall asleep. You may be more restless in your sleep. Uh, if you're looking at it first thing when you wake up in the morning, you've not even allowed yourself to slowly wake up. You know, even if you're not a morning person or if you are a morning person, if the first thing you do is just start scrolling, right? We're not even allowing our, our brains the ability to, um, to do what God designed them to do. And so there is a, a relationship to our mental health and just the filling of our time uh, and making ourselves busy with with this kind of thing so yeah one of the things we're saying with both of these yes we do know that there's a busyness in our lives but we're also saying we feel a lot busier because we don't allow our minds to rest that that's part of the point of why we're camping out on this is is because of the rest that is needed that you don't actually feel like you're getting that rest because or yeah, social media online. exactly. All right, All right. so, so we've, we've, we've talked, talked about, about that one for a while, while but hopefully that gives you some things to really think about and evaluate uh, even for, for yourself, for your families. A um, couple more that we'll hit quickly, and then we're going to move on to an exercise I want you guys to take time to do. Sometimes busyness, it is a necessity, and we need to kind of just recognize that and, and say that uh, for what it is. Sometimes we are working two jobs. There are things, right, trying to provide for a family, um, pay bills, young kids, young kids, cost of living continues to go up, all those kinds of things. Like sometimes we are busy because we have to be busy. Right now, we could step back and say, well, have I put myself in that position because I extended myself too much financially, so now I'm, I have to be busy because of choices that I made? Sure. Right? But the reality is, at times, busyness is a necessity in our life because survival, I mean, just demands it. Uh, and so just knowing, like, yeah, that is sometimes the, the so a source of busyness is, is necessity, but it's... Not, not the only source of busyness. It's, it's one, and I would even tell you it's probably not a, it's not one of the major ones. Um, some of these others, I think, maybe are, are bigger culprits uh, than necessity. But it, it needs to be on the list, necessity. Last one that I want us to look at real quick before we move on to an exercise is that busyness is sometimes just, we see it, it's a means of escape. Yeah. Did you hear she said avoidance? Right? There's stuff in our life that we, we don't want to deal with. Um, past hurts, problems, conflict in relationships. There's just stuff we, we don't want to think about it, so we make sure we don't have time to think about it. Ever been guilty of that? Uh, it never ends well, does it, when we, when we do that. So, so quickly... Take just a minute, if you've got a pen, just for your own, um, your own sake here, just to go back and reflect later, circle or put a star, let's say by the top three on this list of seven that resonate with you. If you would say, yeah, these are, are ones that, that resonate with me. I've, I've been there. Um, I'm most likely to be busy for these three reasons. Just... It'll make for good conversation later uh, when you go home to say, what was your top three? Or maybe at your table before you leave tonight, you know, be nosy and ask the, ask the people sitting with you, hey, what was your top three? All right. So now I want you to take a couple of minutes. You have an old-fashioned paper calendar in front of you for the month of April. All right. Any, anybody use their Franklin planners uh, back in the day before you moved to phones? Yeah, anybody have their cool binders, right? Like I always thought my dad was the coolest guy. He'd come home with that Franklin planner, had his little brass nameplate in the bottom right corner of that thing. Like I so couldn't wait to get a job and be like a professional so that I could get my Franklin planner. But anyway, this page reminds me of a Franklin planner. Um, Here's what I want you to take a few minutes to do. You don't have to know everything, but I want you, to the best that you can remember, fill out this calendar with the things that you have to do each day this month. 
You may not get going to put everything, but I just want you to take a few minutes and populate. Job assigned. Oh, yeah. Do what? Job. What do you want them to do? Oh, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing you can leave off. Okay? If you, we'll say if you work nine hours or less a day, you don't have to put going to work on here. We're going to say everybody is probably working eight or nine hours a day. So we're going to give you those hours. I want you to populate this with everything else that you're filling your time with. That is not what we all have to do, which is go to work, work and sleep, work and sleep. Okay. Work and sleep. We're all doing that. We're all working and sleeping. So those other, those other hours in the day, what are you using those for. They, they want to know if they can pull out their phone calendar to populate the paper calendar. If you really want to get detailed, yes, you can. Um, of course you can. Yeah. Of course you can. It's, we're not testing you on how well you remember yeah, is, your this schedule. This isn't a test of if you remember your calendar. Yeah. This is actually write yeah. it out as best you can. Yeah, it's, it's, just a, it's a thought exercise here to see, to look on a piece of paper here at what you're doing this month. Or on, on an average month, maybe it's not, maybe this month is different, but on a typical month, what are you doing Monday through Friday? What are you doing on the weekends? What's going on in your life? Take a couple of minutes to do that, and then we're going to keep working with this. Who knew calendaring could be so fun? So fun. All right, I'm going to give you, you may not be done and that's okay. I'll give you another minute and a half and then we're going to, we're going to move on. While you're finishing this up, I'm going to go ahead and tell you to flip the page over. And now you will see um, a heading that says values. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, you see one, two, and three listed there with some lines out beside it. 
I want you to write down what do you see as most valuable as far as your time and your priorities go in your life right now. So, but here's what I don't want. I don't want one word answers like my wife. Well, tell me what about your marriage, what about time with your wife you see as the most valuable thing you could be doing in that relationship. If you say my kids, give me more. Like what is it about your parenting, your time with your kids that you see is the most valuable use of your time uh, and priorities. And they can also, you can also add a goal. So if you think in this season of life uh, with your spouse, this is, this is your goal. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a statement, right? It's, it's a value statement of, hey, this is something right now in this season of life that I see is very valuable for me to be doing this for this reason. That's what we want there. It's a little more of a developed thought about, about those things. So take I'm going to give you four minutes to fill out one, two, and three. List those. we were good facilitators like Rick and Sue, we would be getting up and mingling around the room and, and like checking on how everybody's doing with too their lists. So. <laughs> too tired for that. I played basketball last night. I did not. No, you didn't. We needed you. <laughs> All right. 30 more seconds. Right fast. Taryn. She is writing furiously over there. Smoke coming from the table. All right, everybody at a, at a place where you've at least, even if you don't have it all on paper, you, you've, got, you've got it formulated. You know what would be on the paper. It doesn't matter because we're moving we're ahead. We're moving ahead anyway, so whether you do or not. So now I want you to compare. I want you to take your calendar from the previous page. I want you to then look at, then you can think about what you wrote down as values there, one, two, and three. But I want you to write on the next one, two, and three, where there's just one line. Like if you were just to glance at your calendar, what would your calendar say are your top three values? That's why we left work off of here, right? We didn't want you to come away if you're just working to earn a living and, and provide for your family. You say, oh, well, work is it, right? No, so taking that, leaving that off. What does your calendar say your top three priorities and values are? Write that down. So, obviously, the question now is, 
do the one, two, and three at the top of the page match the one, two, and three at the bottom of the page? Yes? If it's yes, that's awesome. Right? Because here's the deal. Our values should be reflected in our schedule. Right? The things that we know should be priorities, the things that we know should be goals that we should be striving for, working toward, we've got to prioritize those things. If our calendar is full of things that don't accomplish those things, then it's just busyness for the sake of busyness, and we're actually not, uh, our values are not reflected in, in what we do. So this is a good exercise to do just for maintenance from time to time, because obviously this can change, can't it? It may be, you know, I saw some, hey, I'm, I'm actually okay right now. Like, I look at my calendar, and the things that should be priorities and values are. Like, I, there, there's some, it, there's some it's, it's, it's working. But also, I bet in the room, there's also, there were some aha moments of, you know, I know this should be a priority, this should be a priority, and this should be a focus of mine in this season of life. But, oh my goodness, my calendar, I don't make any room for it. There's no margin in my calendar to be able to focus on those things. Right? If that's the case, then this is a good exercise. This is not a heaping guilt or trying to make you feel defeated. This is a freeing thing to say, no, you've got the ability to, 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 to adjust, but you have to take the time to look carefully, like our scriptures that we saw from Ephesians, look carefully how you walk, right? Make the best use of your time. This is an exercise just practically in helping us, helping us do that. So hopefully that was, a, that was a helpful thing, but I want us to spend a few minutes here at the end looking at um, time. Page 106 there in your handout, Psalm 90, verse 12. We've already talked about it once. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. There are um, several years ago now, uh, 2013, um, I went to a conference where uh, the, the main speaker was talking about time and the importance of time and how we use our time. And he made four statements about time that started with, when you see how much time you have, you tend to, and he gave us four things. And these have stuck with me for, for a long time, obviously. They, they still are things that I think about. Uh, on a regular basis. So when you see how much time you have, you tend to get serious, number one, about the time you have now. Yes? When you see how much time you have, then you tend to get serious about this time that you have now. We talked about that earlier, that if time is precious, if it is you know, if it is a commodity that right, we don't have an endless amount of, then we have to be, if we understand that, if we understand how much time we have and the importance of time, then we get really serious about how we're using our time. Nobody has to tell us to use our time wisely when we actually pause long enough to consider how precious it really is. Yeah, tell, tell them about the illustration that the guy um, initially gave with the marbles, uh, given how much time you have with your... Uh, uh, with your children before they graduate. Yeah. yeah. So let me um, we'll pull this up for you. I want you to see something here. Thank you for what you've done for the day. Thank you for giving us time. Bless us today with your family, with joy, whatever. 
Right. Yeah, Don's reminding us the importance of abiding in the Spirit and being thankful throughout each and every day. And so to, to look at each day that we have as a, right, it's a gift from Him. And time is a gift from Him. So tell the story yeah. of this illustration. All right. So when uh, when I heard this the first time back in 2013, I had a um, an, a nine year old and a six year old. Okay. Um, and he said that jar of marbles. There, say there's 936 marbles in there. That represents the number of weeks that you have with your child from birth till the time they turn 18 years old, till they graduate high school and become, he just said, till they reach adulthood, okay? So from birth to 18, you have 936 marbles or 936 weeks. And so his challenge was to get a jar of marbles and every week, take a marble out of the jar. You know what that does to your concept and your thinking about the time that you have with your kids when every week you walk to that jar and you pull one out and you watch the number of marbles going down in that jar? He even did something so cruel. Uh, he developed an app where you could plug in their birthday and you could like pull it up and look at a timer. It would count it down for you, even if you didn't have the jar of marbles. And you could see the number of weeks going down. So here I sit now in 2024. Guess what? One of my girls' jar is empty. Right? I've, all 936 of those weeks that I had, right? They're, they're gone. Right? She's off at college. Um, my sophomore in high school, you know how many weeks I have left? You know how many marbles I have left? 112. I have 112 marbles left. So even just that exercise alone causes me to be so much more um, intentional and protective of the time that God has given me as as a dad. So I have gotten more serious. That helped me get more serious about the time that I had. Um, it helped with this. It helped make what matters matter more. You know how one of my daughters was competitive dancer. She, she, she was a really, really good dancer until she hurt her knee. And there was all these opportunities to travel on the weekends to go to dance competitions and to be gone all weekend for those things. But even this idea of understanding, I've got 936 weeks, right? What is the most precious thing that, that matters when it comes to what God has called me to do as a father in the life of my daughter? It wasn't to make sure that she was the best dancer she could be. It was to make sure that she knew how to follow Jesus and she knew how to make decisions based on his word and to value the things that he values and to value her walk with him. So guess what? Sometimes one of the lessons that we taught her as a result of thinking about time was that she needed to prioritize her walk with the Lord over other things. And so we, we, we modeled that and we taught that and we, we learned how to, how to do that. And those weren't always easy conversations, but it was keeping the most important thing in mind as we went along. Um, so what you make, what matters, matter more. Um, well, it's a perfect time to, th if you know you have a finite amount of time, um, and it forces us to prioritize. One of the things that we were talking about earlier is so often in our culture, partly because fear of missing out, guys, we allow our children to dictate our schedule in an unhealthy way. Meaning, look, I'm all about kids' sports and all of that stuff, but there is a limit. And... Uh, when, if you allow the child to populate 
everything based on whims of what that child wants to do here and now and all of that. And you never get around to the important things, the best things, the discipleship things. You're like, well, we just don't have time for that. Well, actually you do. It's, it's you, you have to value um, the great things, the must-do things first. Um, and, and figure out how it all coincides. Um, but but the, the drive and the, and the passion of what's taken place in our culture to, to be overwhelmed with stuff and to have so much activity, um, it, this, the, it, when you understand you have a finite number of days with your kids and here on this earth that the Lord has given you, you, you must, it, it makes you put the, the top things up, up top. Another thing that he said that I loved, and there's some little sub points to this one, and I want to walk through these as quickly as we can, but, but give these to you. When you see how much time you have, you tend to value what happens over time. Understanding that, you know, it's not just I need to do a good job this month or this week with my time. No, it, this is for the long haul. How am I doing with understanding and prioritizing and, and, and being a good steward of my time that God has blessed me with? Uh, how, do I, how do I value what happens over time? And so he's, he mentioned some things. He said, so here are things that happen over time that we have the opportunity to do with our kids, even with our spouses, um, even with other people that God has called us to walk with and disciple. Right? It doesn't have to just be our children or our grandkids. These can be people in our, in our small groups that God has placed us in community with. Like over time, there are some really incredible things that happen when we understand how precious time can be. And here's what he said. He said, when we, can, when we are consistent about prioritizing and showing love to others over time, that it gives them a sense and an understanding of their worth, right? We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Our worth ultimately comes from him. Our value comes from him, right? But God can use us, right, in the way that we demonstrate love to others by the use of time, prioritizing time with them, showing them love by the way we spend time with them to remind them of their value that they have in Christ, when we are careful with our words, when we are consistent with using our words to, to build up, to encourage, to speak truth into the life of those around us, words over time give direction. So we could go back to our social media and our smartphone illustration and say, if family time is everybody on their device or is everybody watching TV, there's not a lot of words being spoken. And words are one of the things that God uses to give direction. And so turning those off long enough to have conversations, talking about what's going on in life. Hey, let's see, what are you dealing with? What's going on? Let's see what God's word has to say about that. Let's, let's look at, right, is this true? What you're feeling, what you're experiencing, what, you what you're thinking, what you're, what you're hearing. Let's, let's process these things. Let's, let's talk about them. Words over time give direction. And mealtime as a family, statistics have shown, like, will blow you away. The, the positive impact of just having a meal and talking together consistently as a family okay yeah. use meal time every one of your kids eats so circle up eat together and talk yeah i would even say use in addition to that use drive time if you're taking your kids to school taking them to practice for a sport or piano or right use drive time turn the radio off right and talk Words, words matter. Words are important. They do give direction. And they also, this is another one. He said, hey, stories over time give perspective. 
They help our, our kids. They help those around us. When we're telling stories about what God has done in our life and how we navigated certain situations and we weathered certain storms and we, and we see how God brought us through those and he was faithful and he was good and, and he, he, he led us in the midst of that and he showed us grace and mercy. When the people around us hear those things, over time, it helps to give them a perspective that maybe is different from the one that they had before. So that matters when we do that over time. Something else that he said, don't ever forget this, and I remember this. He said, fun over time gives you connection. And I thought that, that is one of those things we don't stop and think about enough. It is good to have fun together. Of course, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a godly thing, right, to enjoy time together. Um, one of the things the last two years since we've lived in Bernie, it dawned on me, right, the number of marbles as my oldest daughter's jar was emptying, I realized I had two school years left with her. And I also realized that meant I had two football seasons left with her. We had built up this tradition over the years of, in the fall, watching Tennessee football games together every Saturday. That was, that was our thing that we did. And it wasn't, it became, it wasn't even as much about the football as it was just the connection, the spending time together, the meals we would eat around the games. So you know what I did? The last two falls that I had with her, I prioritized fun on those Saturdays. Now, the outcome of the game wasn't always fun, but let me tell you, the time was, and the connection that it built uh, is invaluable. Fun over time does build connection. And, and what you said earlier, uh, what you said to me was that uh, you, you cut, because you prioritized that, there were lots of things, other things that you could have done during that time that were good things, but because you had a priority, and because you realized that those days were short, you kept that as uh, the thing to do. You were, you were going to not do other things that were good things, and that's what, that's what prioritization does. It gives you the freedom to say no to stuff, okay? Say no to stuff that, that you don't have to do, because you must do the best things, Okay? And then the last one, it says, hey, our, our relationships, our tribes, the people we connect and do life with, over time, it gives us a sense of belonging, right? A lot of things that we fill our time with, the busyness, actually make us feel more isolated and disconnected. But our relationships that we form, right? Christ-centered, gospel-centered community. That's why we tell people when you, it's like, hey, if you really want to get connected in a church, get in a growth group. Why? Because those relationships centered around God's word and centered around Christ are going to give you a sense of belonging and connection that we all desperately need. But we have to prioritize that. We've got to prioritize using our time for that. And then the last thing that he said, when you see how much time you have, you tend to be more present for a few. And what he said as a follow, as an ending to that, he said, your legacy is going to be with the people that you are present with right now. That's the legacy that you're leaving, the people that you're investing in, the people that you're pouring into, the people that your schedule, your time is leading you to invest in, right? That, that's your legacy. It's not the number of hours you spend at work. It's not the number of baseball games uh, that you make or soccer practices that you go to or, or whatever. Right? It's, it's, those, it's those people that you're investing in. So he says, be present in the lives of, of people. Be pre you know, the people God has put in your circle. Be present there. That is a use of time that will help protect us from just busyness for the sake of busyness. So these, I hope these are helpful. I hope these are good, um, just practical ways to think about our schedules, how we use our time. Helping us guard against busyness that is unhealthy and understanding that our schedules should be determined by our values and not just, you know, letting our schedules be set by other things. So hopefully all these are helpful. An exercise that I would encourage you to do this week after thinking about this 
you know, maybe the marble, maybe the jar of marbles just really kind of messed with you and you're going to go home and be like, man, I really hate that I came on Wednesday night because now every week I'm going to like, I'm going to start calculating how many marbles I have left before my kids are gone. Thanks a lot, Daniel. That was what I wanted tonight was to, was to hear that. I am, I am leaving here ready to cry. But here's, here's an exercise. So while you're already kind of, you know, you know, in that, in that soft spot and in all those emotions, Write a letter to yourself based on those things that you, you wrote down earlier about what you value and what your value should be in this season of life five years from now. Five, five years from now, what are the things you hope will be true? If you do those things, if you're valuing the right things, if you're prioritizing the right things, investing in the right places, saying no to good things to say yes to the best things. Five years from now, write yourself a letter about what you hope that will five years from now will look like in these areas. Does that make sense? I think it'll be a good exercise and will probably be one of those things that will help you in this moment to do the right things that will set you on a trajectory to, to be there. Yeah, to get there. To get there, okay? All right, All right. we've kept you way too long. We're six, six minutes over. over. Good, night. Good night. I'm going to let you go. Um, next, next week starts, starts parenting. parenting. Oh, oh do we have, have a... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. You guys have a great night. Next week, we will start looking at uh, parenting. We've got about five weeks. We're going to look at what are we supposed to be as parents and who are these kids God has given us and what do we do with them? That's, that's the next several weeks, okay?